Okay, so uh, so welcome back, everyone. This is our last workshop for the week. You've made it through a lot of learning, um, and uh, you know, again, we are throwing a lot of this at you uh, early on to kind of make sure that you have at least some of the tools, at least you know, we've at least seen them, so that when we start to do the research, they'll be a little bit faster to pick up. And of course, all of us expect that you'll you know you'll be experimenting and playing with these over the next couple of weeks, just get some familiarity. Um, and actually, part of what you'll be doing is actually identifying where do are we missing things, some of these tools, and where do we develop new tools, and that's that's part of the programming part of this. Um, so what I'm going to show today is the splat code, or at least some parts of the splat code. Let me share my screen again here. Uh, let me find the right window because I have so many open. Okay, there we go. All right, so we're going to be looking at this uh, SPLAT spectral analysis. Um, and just to give a very rough overview of what, uh, what this code is, um, it's actually code that we've developed here in our CoolStar lab. I think we started developing this back like 2013 or 14 or something like that, or 15. It's been a while. So, and, and I should say, this has actually been largely developed by students, um, undergraduate students, graduate students, uh, some postdocs. Uh, and of course, myself, as we've been trying to figure out how, what are the pieces that we need for doing the kind of spectral analysis that we commonly do in our, in our research work. So SPLAT stands for the Specs Prism Library Analysis Toolkit. It's a lot of words, but Specs Prism, Specs is the instrument that we'll be looking at and you'll be reducing some data for. Prism is the low resolution mode. It's a library, so it contains actually somewhere on the order about 3000 spectra um, taken from this instrument. And then the analysis toolkit part is the additional code that we put in so that we can actually start to work with these data. So instead of just having a, you know, like a, a place where you can just download some spectra and then everyone has their own codes for doing these things, we've tried to curate all the sort of usual spectral analysis methodologies that we apply into one set of codes. Now, keep in mind, this is, uh, you know, a work of, of our, you know, a work of passion from our research group. Um, and so there's lots of things that, you know, there's little bugs here and there, and so we often find things that are problematic. So um, one of the things that links there is, one, is the GitHub uh, link for the code. Uh, and that will, of course, also be posted up on the, on the website. Um, as you're working with this code, if you find a problem or something that doesn't quite work the way it's supposed to, or it just, just doesn't work at all, um, there is a, a place where you can, uh, you know, point out problems. And actually, I'll bring that up. Um, that's in the, sorry, let me go to the right code here. Here's the Splat GitHub repository, and there's an issues section, and that's where you can kind of list some of the issues that folks are having. So I've definitely, you know, already seen several of them that we're trying to fix as we go through. Okay, so, um, but again, hopefully a lot of what you'll be doing during the course of summer uh, will be relatively straightforward because the, the core aspects of doing analysis are already coded up in Splat. And mostly then you'll be doing is just thinking about how can we analyze separate parts of these spectra, how can we do specific types of analyses, um, you know, but hopefully the tools to do those are already available to you. Um, now there's a whole bunch of packages within this package. So really complex code has sub packages. And you've already seen examples of that. Uh, for example, with AstroPy, it had a units sub package and a coordinate sub package. Um, and so we organized the functionalities based on these packages. Um, so, you know, most of what we're looking at are is sort of in the core part of it, which is kind of the, the very baseline, I want to grab a spectrum, I want to do some basic analysis on it, and I want to visualize it. That's all contained in the core package. But there's also other uh, tools that are buried throughout. Um, some of them include uh, empirical relations. So these are things that people have measured. For example, the absolute magnitude of brown dwarfs as a function of spectral type. Instead of going up and looking that, you know, looking at that information, we already have it coded into the, 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 the software. Um, like I said, we had there's many different tools for plotting the spectra. Um, in addition to using Matplotlib, which will show how you can do that as well, um, we have tools for integrating photometry, those magnitudes, with the spectra, and that's important for doing things like scaling the spectra to a given absolute magnitude, or to actually extract out what the colors of the source are based on the spectrum. And then um, we also have a set that uses model atmosphere. So if you want to compare the spectra to what predictions are for the spectra, those are model atmospheres. So we have a section on that. Um, more broadly, if we're looking at how these brown dwarfs in particular evolve, we have a section on that incorporates several different evolutionary models. Um, so we can make predictions, for example, what the temperature would be of a, say, 0.05 solar mass brown dwarf after 
5 billion years. We can actually just look that up from the evolutionary models. Um, we have a database section that allows us to both manage the database of spectra, but also to grab some of the data from other catalogs. And you had an example of that in the last section. So we basically have just wrapper functions that use the Astro query tool to get some of this, the uh, important information for these sources. And then we have a code that allows us to simulate whole brown dwarf populations. Um, in fact, that's something that uh, Christian and Dino have been uh, working on at least pieces of that for a lot of their analysis of, of brown dwarf samples. And so those of you who will be working on a project that involves a sample of brown dwarfs may be becoming familiar with that simulate uh, package. And then we have things that just help us manage like citations for the different um, uh, papers that point to the spectra and other utilities that are useful. And um, this is a lot of information. So we do have a, um, uh, a documentation page, uh, which I have no idea which one of these tabs it is, uh, but I'll click on one. Um, and I should say that this is a little, this is actually quite a bit out of date. This is based on a 2018 version. Um, one of my summer projects is to kind of get this up to the current, current status, but it does have enough information to kind of get you started on what are the major tools. Um, there's a nice quick start uh, section here that allows you that We'll actually cover some of the things that we're going to be doing today, and then some details about things like spectral modeling and stuff like that. So if you want to look through that on your own time, you're more than welcome. All right. So today, what we're going to be doing is looking at how we can access the spectral data that's already contained in SPLAT, how we can visualize, so making plots of the spectra, um, how we can manipulate the spectra. And that means maybe masking out certain sections, scaling the spectra up and down, changing the units, for example. And then how we can start combining spectra. Um, now, spectra are, you know, they're actually kind of complex things if you think about it. It's just one, it's not just one number. It's a series of numbers with a unit. We talked about units the last section. Um, that's as a function of wavelength, which has a unit, and also has an uncertainty uh, as a function of wavelength. And so when you say you're adding two spectra together, there's actually a lot of math behind that. And so um, Fortunately, a lot of that's already put under the hood in this code, and so it actually makes it uh, quite trivial to do, but we'll see how we can uh, you manipulate that. And then um, we'll also see how we can do some uh, certain basic analyses, particularly spectral classification, which is one of the most important things we do with spectra, is just figure out what kind of star this is. And then we can start going from there to really detail more physical properties about those objects. So that's basically what we're going to go through today. Um, and uh, let me take a pause to see if there's any questions. And Dina, would you mind if, if folks ask questions in the chat window to interrupt me? Because I may not be looking at the chat window as I go. Uh, yeah, definitely. Thank you. OK, so I'm not seeing any questions yet. But I'm sure they may come up. So um, let's go ahead and go back to my screen. And so this is when you want to bring up the uh, Jupyter Notebook in your own screen. Um, so here I have it here in my, um, my Jupyter Notebook entry here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and scroll down a little bit and get us to where I started. So today we're going to be looking through several different packages. And I actually I have to think, I don't think we're actually using all of these packages today, but it's good to kind of upload everything. So I do want to kind of explicitly walk through some of these steps so that they start to become familiar. Um, this is usually what you'll see at the top of almost every, you know, Jupyter Notebook code or even regular Python code is the packages that we're going to import. Um, and like I said, we're not going to actually use all of these uh, for this demonstration, so I think I have these as play placeholders. Um, but we're definitely going to import the Splat package, and then we're going to import some of the sub packages, including plot, photometry, and empirical. Um, so that's what these codes do here, these lines do here. And then you'll see some familiar other uh, functions. We had the netplotlib, numpy, pandas, we've already talked about, and some astropy stuff in there as well. So if I just run that, um, this first run you'll notice takes a little longer than usual because Splat actually in its first call loads up some of the spectral data that's already in there, or at least a, a spreadsheet of them. So you can see there's these uh, messages that come up that tell you what sources are being uploaded. And you can see there's quite a few are already being uploaded in here. Um, but this is sort of building up the spectral library that's within uh, your now uh, you know, program that's sort of loaded in already. Now, there's a few things that are just useful to kind of check when you're running Splat. I always encourage folks to take a look at the version number because um, it tells you how up-to-date or not your Splat version is. So this is actually up-to-date as of today. 
Um, you might have a different date on there because I did just update it today, but that's okay. There wasn't much in terms of changes. Um, you can also take a look at what data is available. The main data set is in this uh, constant db underscore spectra. So just to kind of point out the notation here, this is of course the package. And then this is a variable that's within the package object, right? So this is just like a class where I've defined a variable in the class and I can, I can reference it as you know, that class dot something. So this is really just, just a variable, but that variable actually contains uh, 3089 spectra. And in fact, if I uh, get rid of the print length here and I just do this, that's our pandas table of all the sources that are in there. So you can see that it goes up to 388 and all sorts of information scrolling across there. All right, so this is just your spectral library. There's another database of the source information that's in here. Uh, I think it's just source or maybe sources, nope, sources. All right, so same kind of thing. So hopefully you're seeing, again, you know, these pandas tables, like this is how we're, we're formatting all our spreadsheet information here. Uh, and this is already uploaded when you upload Splat. And there's other information there you can find out, you know, who's contributed to the code. Hey, there's Christian. I don't know if Dino, you're in here. We have to put you in here somewhere. Um, I think there's also a web page. Yep, uh, that's actually not very helpful. So a lot of these things are just kind of baseline information things that we use to kind of keep track of the code. Um, but, you know, they're also providing kind of important information about um, how the code is made and, and what, uh, what references are according to it. All right, so that's just preliminary stuff. It's getting us introduced to the Slack code. Now let's actually get some Spectra in. So the main call to get Spectrum from the catalog is this uh, function called get Spectrum. And it has lots of different um, uh, things that are associated with it. And again, as always, you can type in the name of the function and put a question mark. And on this screen, it will show the help down at the bottom. And it will show some of, although not all, because I apparently haven't filled this in entirely, but it'll show some of the options and some examples of how to use the code to get certain things. So we're gonna walk through some of these examples in just a little bit. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to get one random spectra and we select a random spectrum by this keyword lucky. So you're, if you wanna get lucky, you get one lucky equals true spectrum. Um, and I should say that when you first, when you call this command, let me get rid of this code uh, here for a second. Um, what it returns is a list of spectrum objects. Um, and so you can see that's notation, the brackets here means it's a list. So in most cases, when I call this command, I'll put a zero, bracket zero on it, because I just want the thing that's in the list, the first thing that's in the list. So that's what that notation is. And what I'm gonna do is call that, and you can see it just gives me this text. But you know, as uh, Christian was showing earlier when we are doing uh, the AstroPy uh, units, for example, um, this is a representation of the object. It's not the object itself. It's just kind of a, the string that's associated with it. Um, we can get more information about the spectrum itself by using some of its inbuilt functions. So the first one we're going to look at is just plot. Um, so if I just call that, it brings in a spectrum and it plots one. So we have a nice quick visual way of seeing what kind of spectrum we have. Um, it's got the wavelengths and fluxes here, and then it's also got the name of the source that's associated with it as well. And you know, I can have a lot of fun all day long just continually pushing this and looking at all sorts of random spectra. Um, but that's kind of the basic idea of, of how we, we read these in. Um, the other thing you can get is some information about the spectrum itself that comes from our library, and that's organized in this function called info. So if I click that, it gives me a little bit more string information, uh, including the name of the source, when it was observed, and notice that in some cases it doesn't have information. So you see that man there, not a number. That just means that we don't have that information in our spreadsheet. And then some other stuff about signal to noise, what its classification is, and then the citation information. All right, so now we can also be a little bit more selective about what spectra we want. So for example, if I only wanna get an L5 dwarf, but I just want the, the you know, my lucky one here, then it will go through and just search for L5 dwarfs. So there's one, there's another, there's another, right? So again, have fun all day long. Um, notice that they, by the way, they weren't all the same. Part of the scaling was a little bit different because the uh, if there's extra noise on the end, sometimes it scales it funny. 
but the shapes are actually a little bit different. And that's actually one of the things that we're interested in studying is how these, is, even though they're all classified the same spectral type, how those shapes actually vary according to other physical properties. Um, we can also select it explicitly based on its source ID or source key. And this is something that you have to actually know in advance. So it's not necessarily something you would know ahead of time. Um, but you know, you know there's 3,000, they start with 10,000, so you can always get a, a, a particular one that way as well. Um, and then we can also get a spectrum based on the name of the source. So um, this uh, call is going to find all of the spectra of this source whose name is TWA30A, the brightest component of this binary system. And so I'm going to print out what that looks like. And so there's three of these files. You can see the list that comes back is now a list with three elements, and those three elements are each spectrum objects. And um, it plots each of those in a nice for loop, and you can see you've got three spectra that are actually a little bit different. And this is a variable star. And just for completeness, I'll just say, you know, you can type something like type uh, sp, which is from the spectrum, and you can see that this is clearly not a, a number, it's a special type of object um, called a spectrum object, which we defined inside the code. All right, and then uh, I should say there's one other way we can search for things. Um, we can also search by uh, the short name, and short name is the first four numbers of the right ascension and the first four numbers of the declination. So one of my favorite objects is 0559 minus 1404. So five hours, 59 minutes, minus 14 degrees for arc minutes. We actually use that source when we talked about coordinates. So I'll do the same syntax bring that up and you can see there's that source 0559 minus 1404 and it's definitely t-dwarf and we can also get some more information about it any questions uh at this point okay not seen any yet so i'll keep going on um all right so then we can also search more broadly in the library without actually loading up all the spectra, because sometimes the spectra can be quite, uh, you know, take a little time to load in. Um, we have another uh, command called search library. And what this returns is a pandas database of all the spectra that match the search, uh, search list. So I'm going to search for this other source, TWA30B. Uh, and that's a quite fast, and it will return all 20 spectra of this object. You can see they all have the same name, the same designation, same coordinate, but they are observed on different dates. And I'm not sure if that's actually something you can see here. Oh, there it is. Nope. Uh, so that's one of the columns that's hidden because it's such a big table. Um, but that's another way we can search. We can also, for example, search for um, everything that is uh, between spectral type L5, oops, spectral type L5, oh boy. L5 to L9. So instead of giving just one spectral type, I did an arrange here with a signal to noise ratio that's greater than 40 or 50, for example. And if I type that, I get 125 sources that match that requirement. So search library is a good way to kind of start off, like kind of browsing what's available before you load in like a ton of spectra. Um, it kind of gives you sort of an initial, initial look at things. All right, and then um, if I go back, let me go back to, oh, let's see. So I can choose one of these spectra. So I've, you know, I've loaded up this library, this S thing here is a pandas database, and I can refer to um, the data key within the database and take the first one, which is really the second one in the list. And when I put it into the splat.spectrum, it'll just load up the one that corresponds to that data key. So that's one way that I can grab that one particular spectrum. All right, and then um, it's also possible to read in spectra that are not in the library. And uh, there are some constraints on what the format of the spectrum has to be. And this is something that we'll be working on a little bit this summer to make it more broad. Um, but, in, and again, if it's a specs prism spectrum, usually you can read this in pretty easily. 
And so this is just a, a reference, a URL reference to a FITS file that lives somewhere on my computer. And it just happens to be another specs prism spectrum. So I'm going to download this file through this command, which is actually part of AstroPy, and then read it into a spectrum object using this syntax file equals F, which is this thing. Uh, I'm letting it know that the file type is a FITS file. And then it, because this file may not actually know what the name is, because that's actually contained in the database, I can actually explicitly name the object based on the name that I know it is. So if I run that, it's going to go online, grab the spectrum, read it in, turn it into one of these spectrum objects. And there you go. You've got it all right there. OK, so that's kind of, the, again, the basics of reading in spectra. The whole idea is that once we get the spectrum file or information into one of these spectrum objects, we can start to use all of this, you know, functions within the spectrum object to, to do some work. And you know, one of the things you can always do if you know the spectrum object is a special thing, we can actually use our question mark notation to find out what's in the spectrum object. That brings up the doc string for that, and that tells you some of the different parameters and some of the ways that it can be called. Okay. All right, any uh, questions at this point? So we're just looking at right now some comments and some code to navigate through the Splat library. We don't, we aren't doing anything like operating with numbers or. Yeah, at this point, all we're doing is, is reading in the spectrum. But once we get it into this spectrum object, this, it's actually really a class that we've defined for this code. Then that allows us to use all of the functions that are associated with the class. And there's, and you know, that's one of the ways that when you're thinking about how you program, if you're working with a particular data object, so we work with spectra, right? That's a data object. Um, an, a, one of the sort of Python ways of, of working and organizing your programming is to, if there's a bunch of operations that you commonly use with spectra, then you put it into the object. And so when you read in a new spectrum, it has, it basically inherits all of those operations automatically. So yes, at this stage, all we're doing is just reading in some spectra. But once we've done that, we can take advantage of all the other uh, functionality of the code. Okay, I'm gonna have move on. Um, okay, so the first thing first, you know, once we've got that, we've already seen, seen how we can plot some spectra up, but there's actually some, uh, some additional kind of bells and whistles for plotting the spectra. You know, that was just kind of showing some wiggly lines. You may or may not understand what that means at all, um, but we can do a little bit more with the spectra by plotting them um, with some information attached. So I'm gonna start by just getting a good uh, L4 spectral type with a pretty good signal to noise. We'll plot that up. All right, so there's my source. And now what I can do is I can start to just layer some stuff onto this plot to kind of understand it a little bit better. So one of the things we can look at is, um, one of the things you'll, you'll, you'll be looking at when you do the spectral reduction is one of the corrections we have to do when we observe from the ground is correct for the fact that we have an atmosphere above us and it absorbs some of the light from, from the stars. So we can actually label where those points are. And it may be a little hard to see on your screen, but there's a few very light gray bands that run through here. And the main point here is it allows us to visualize that these are regions that might be a little bit more noisy or might not be you know, as reliable because we're absorb looking at it through this absorbed atmosphere. So it's just kind of a labeling we could put on the graph to kind of you know, tell us that you know, we should or should not believe those particular parts of the spectrum. Now, of course, all of these features, uh, all these wiggles are coming from absorption features from various molecules and atoms. So we can uh, explicitly say, please label the features that are corresponding to these molecules, iron, hydride, water, and carbon monoxide. So it will, it already knows where those exist. So it will mark those on our plot, right? So there's carbon monoxide there. This whole thing is water. There's a little iron hydride right there. So this gives us some idea of where some of these features are. Um, and then there's even predefined sets of features. So for example, we know L dwarfs typically have a particular set of absorption features present in the spectrum. So if I just say L dwarf equals true, it will label all of the L dwarf features, there's actually quite a few. It gets a little bit crowded down here. Um, but that labels sort of all the features that we expect to see in L dwarfs. 
And you know, this allows us to understand what features are present and in some cases what features are not present. So if something's labeled here, but there's not clearly any absorption feature, uh, then that might tell us that this might be something that's unusual or maybe even misclassified because it doesn't have the feature that we expect it to be there. Right. So a good example is, uh, you know, I don't, there's a sodium doublet. So a couple of lines that are associated with sodium uh, atoms in the atmosphere that's labeled here, but I don't really see anything. So this is, this may be a source that's either too cold to have sodium, or maybe there's some reason that sodium is missing in this, this atmosphere. So this provides kind of a visual map of what kind of features are creating the spectra that we see there. Um, you can also save the spectra out. So I'm going to actually change the output here to my home directory. Um, let's actually put it on the desktop. So um, all you do to save a file is just put output and the ending will determine what kind of output it is. You can use PDF and PNG. I think you can also use EPS. There's a few other formats that are available. Um, but if I just do that and oops, it, made, it seemed to barf, maybe it doesn't know where that is. Oh, okay. So let's, let's be a little bit more careful here. Uh, slash home slash, is it like that? No. Okay. So let's just put it, let's just put it in the local directory. All right. So, uh, you have to make sure you give it a path where it actually knows where to put it. Um, and that did show up and, um, I will show you what that file looks like. All right, so there's that file. And so, you know, it looks very much like we had on the screen, but now it's a PDF and I could put it into a presentation or I could put it into a paper. All right, so that's kind of a nice convenient uh, system there. All right. And then you can, you, so there's, I should say, I'm only going through a few examples here. There's a lot of different things you can do. Um, I'll show you another sort of complex one. So I showed you before that when I searched the library for all the spectra of TW30B, there were 20 of them. Um, now you could plot 20 individual files if you want, um, or if you wanted to see what the variations in the spectra are, you may want to actually plot all these spectra um, on the same document. So you can kind of see them side by side. So uh, one of the uh, options we have for that is um, uh, for the, uh, this is the specs, uh, sorry, splat.plot package, which I've renamed splat. There's a specific function called plot spectrum. And in fact, every time we type dot splat or dot plot after the spectrum object, it's actually calling this command. So it's kind of a, a buried sort of link in there, but this is the main code. And there's lots of different options in here. So one of the things I could do is I could make a, I can read in all 20 of those spectra and I'm actually explicitly getting them through this get spectrum code. So that will read in 20 spectra into 20 into a list of 20 spectra. I can normalize all of those. I'll add a legend to my plots. And then I'm gonna plot this list of spectra using multi-plot. So it's gonna make a multiple individual plots for each spectrum. Uh, I'm gonna have a two by two grid of these plots. I'm gonna use multiple pages and uh, put a legend on each of them. And then I'm actually also specifying the axis range so that they're all on the same scale. And then I'm going to save it to this file. So there's a lot of commands that have come in here, but it allows you some control on how this, this looks. So if I run this code, it takes a, a little bit of time because it has to actually find and retrieve all 20 of those files and move them into spectrum objects. Um, but in just a moment here, it should finish up. And so what it's done is it's made kind of a a list of figures, and this is what it looks like on our screen. But it's also generated a new PDF file, and I will switch to that so you can see that. Maybe. Let's try that again. Okay. So it's made this PDF file that now has on each page for spectra, and it's ordered. Uh, or at least it's indicating the date in which the data has been acquired. That was what I put in the legend. So, um, so what I can do is just kind of zoom through here and see, oh, you know, like it looks like there's a little bit more light here than it was here. Um, and it gets really bright over here. So like, there's definitely something going on with the star where it's really variable over the course of the observations. Um, and that of course means that's something I should probably pay more attention to and figure out what, what's going on with that, that strange source. All right. 
Okay, any questions uh, on plotting? And again, there are a lot of different parameters, variations. There are things where you can set like little inset boxes in the plot. You can overlay a comparison source on each plot. There's all sorts of different uh, variations here. So I'm just showing you some of the basics. Okay, not seeing anything yet. Uh, hopefully you're able to, to play along by using the, the uh, tutorial yourself. All right, so uh, to get now, so that was all, like we haven't done anything with the spectra yet. All we've done is kind of read them in and visualize. Let's see how we can actually start to manipulate the spectra and make some measurements. So um, first we're gonna start off with just a random T5 dwarf here, mid-type T dwarf that has very strong methane features. Um, you know, I can verify that by putting T dwarf equals true in my plot statement and I'll label all those features there. Right, methane and water and stuff like that. Um, so here's some of the things we can do. So first of all, what I'm gonna do is just normalize the spectrum and it's just gonna normalize to the max value. So again, this is just a function that's in that spectrum object. So I call it with this dot notation. And so if I do that, the only thing that really changed is that you'll notice that before this peak was a little bit above one, now that peak is almost exactly one. In fact, it's not that peak because there's a bright spot over here. So I might not wanna take the normalization of the absolute maximum spectrum because if there's noise, that's gonna throw it off. I could specify a range over which I want to normalize it. So for example, maybe I wanna normalize it to this peak instead. So if I select that normalization, notice now that that one corresponds to this peak. So this is really just scaling the spectrum up and down, but it allows us to kind of choose different regions where we wanna normalize it. And this will be useful again for sort of visualizing the spectrum. Um, I can also scale up the spectrum by just a scale factor. So that's just scale. So I wanna make this 50 times brighter. Voila, it is 50 times brighter, just like that. Um, and there's other things I can do. So that's just arbitrary numbers, but in fact, there's meaningful scalings I might wanna do. Um, so for example, um, uh, we know that different spectral types have different absolute magnitudes. And just a reminder that an absolute magnitude is the brightness of a star if it was at 10 parsecs. It kind of provides us with a, you know, even comparison of stars of different, you know, intrinsic brightnesses so that we're looking at just their intrinsic brightness and not the fact that they're far or close away. So one of the things we can do is we can actually just scale the spectrum so that its absolute magnitude corresponds to perhaps some measurement we know what its absolute magnitude is. So in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna scale the spectrum so that it has, so I'm scaling it so that its absolute magnitude in the two mass J band is equal to 14.5. And this uh, extra parameter here just signals to the spectrum object that we're now scaled to absolute fluxes. And it turns out for some other analyses later on, that might be useful, for example, if we wanna figure out what the radius of the star is, we need to make sure we're, we're looking at this in units of absolute fluxes. So if I do that code, dot flux calibrate, and I plot it again. Again, nothing's really changed with the shape of the spectrum, but notice now the scale is quite a bit different. We're now in sort of units of 10 to the minus 11 ergs per centimeter squared per micron per second. That's a flux density unit. Um, but it, you know, this is now correctly scaled so that these are in fluxes if the star was at 10 parsecs away. And again, this is particularly useful for comparing to models where the models you know, are calculating what the surface flux should be. And so, by making sure these are properly scaled, then we can actually infer information like the size of the star. Um, there's other things we can do. We can uh, trim the spectrum a little bit. So it's a little bit noisy here at the short and long wavelengths. So I might just wanna get rid of those parts. So if I trim those out, you see we've gotten a nice, nice cleaner spectrum just because we got rid of the bad stuff. Um, we can also mask out certain parts of the spectrum. Um, so if I remember to label the telluric regions here. Um, there's a right telluric band right here where again, we might have some pretty bad data. And you know, in some spectra, this might be really, really noisy. So I might wanna just mask that out. So I can use this mask flux command. And that will basically just turn all those flux points to NANDs. And so now I don't even see them. So that's kind of a good way to kind of, there's a really bad noisy spectrum and you know it's not gonna be very useful. You can mask it out with this NAND. Um, and then we can also play with the units, right? So the units are important uh, uh, parts of this. Um, and as we talked about, 
in the uh, last workshop, you can convert between units if you're using the AstroPy units. And these are AstroPy units. So you can see that familiar U dot and then a, a unit here. So right now our wavelength is in units of microns, which is a very common, that's 10 to the minus six meters or micrometers. It's a very common wavelength scale for infrared work. But when we do optical spectroscopy, sometimes we use another unit called an angstrom, which is 10 to the minus 10 meters, both lengths. So I can use this two wave unit command to change this unit to uh, microns. And if I plot that up, again, nothing has really changed with the shape. It comes back there, there we go. Nothing's changed with the shape, but now the scale has changed so that I'm, I'm plotting this in these units. And I can do the same thing to my flux units. I can change them from energy per area per micron per seconds to energy per area per angstrom. Uh, this is actually power, so energy per time per angstrom per area, and that works. If you get this combination wrong, it will just say you can't do that because it's incorrect uh, comparison units. Um, but this is a way of sort of changing your units so that you get uh, the you know different ways of sort of viewing these. Yeah, nothing has changed with the spectrum itself, but it's provided now sort of a different scale to, to plot these. Okay, and then if you do all this and then you say, I don't actually want to do all this or I've made a mistake, that's okay. It always saves a copy of its original form. So you can do this sp.reset and it will set it back to what its original plot looked like. All right, any questions about that? Crystal clear. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So um, the next section here is now how we do some math with our spectra. And I mentioned, you know, that spectra are you know fairly complex things. They are, you know, they're not just a number. They're a sequence of numbers that have units. They have uncertainties associated with them. And so the splat code has actually integrated all the ways of combining spectra into what looks like basic math functions, but are actually doing a lot more than just a simple addition. So to kind of see how this works, um, first gonna read in two M-type spectra. I'm gonna kind of choose from a range here between M5 and M9 and choose two of them. And I'm gonna to normalize together. And then I'm gonna do this command, which adds the spectra together. So it's very easy, right? It's just using the plus sign, but I should say that this is a different kind of addition We've actually redefined addition in the spectrum objects so that when it sees this plus sign, it knows to do something totally different. Fortunately, from your perspective, you don't care, right? Because all you have to do is add, is add them together. That's it, super easy. Um, so we're gonna do that. And then I'm gonna, so I'm putting a few things in the cell. We're also gonna then plot it. Instead of using the uh, plot spectrum codes, we're gonna use just the regular matplotlib plot sequence. And I wanted to show how you can do that here. So. These are the plots uh, kind of statements that uh, Christian was showing earlier. And what I'm doing is I'm referring to the elements in the spectrum object that have the wavelength, and that's dot wave, and the flux, which is dot flux. And I'm doing that for the individual spectra and then for the added sum. And then I just have a legend here to kind of show what that looks like. So I'm going to do all those commands all at once. All right, so here's what we get. So again, this is my first spectrum that I randomly read in. Here's my second one, and here's the sum of them. And that's it, no problem, right? And of course, I can also look at the sum of the spectrum by calling its native plot function, and that shows that as well. You can see it actually explicitly tells you that this is the addition of these two spectra, All right? Um, here's another example of subtraction. So I'm gonna take, Again, two random spectra um, that are the same subtype, but then see what the difference is between them. So I'm going to subtract them after I've normalized them. And then I'm doing two plots here. The top plot is going to show each individual spectrum, and the bottom plot is going to show the difference. So I'm going to fill that in. All right. So I actually got two very different spectra here. Um, so you can see they've been normalized to their peaks, so they're slightly different in where their scales are, and the difference is shown here. 
and I've compared it to the uncertainty and, you know, compared to the uncertainties of these two objects, this spec these spectra are clearly very different from each other. So um, I can do this again, see if I get a, a more normal pair of M7 dwarfs. All right, so those are a little bit closer, but you can see that they are still different. And that difference looks like it has kind of a pattern to it. So sometimes we will do this for particularly maybe a spectrum that's a little unusual. We'll compare it to one that is similar uh, in spectral type and see why is it unusual. Uh, the difference between the spectrum might tell us something about maybe there's another source there that's adding to the light. Um, maybe there's a dust ring around the source, and so that's contributing long wavelength lights. So these are kind of the a simple uh, uh, sort of math operations with the spectra to see if we can understand why they might be different from each other. All right, so Juan has a question um, that why do we have to normalize them to be able to add or subtract them? So you don't have to, but the problem is that the spectra may have very different vertical scales, and that may just be because one is very bright compared to the other one or in some of these spectra, they've already been pre-normalized because we get them from other folks. Um, and so if I drop these commands, and by the way, this is something you can do as you play with the, with the um, tutorials, is you should be like, you know, changing commands, you know, um, modifying things. If I do that, um, what sometimes will happen is, yeah, I don't actually see any of the spectra because the difference is so big that it's actually off scale. And that's partly because I set the scale, I fixed the scale to be the certain range. I get rid of those Y scales and I run this again. So, you know, in this case, this source is way brighter than this source. So we don't actually get a really good subtraction. So that's why I do the normalization ahead of time is I I'm looking for differences when they're close to normals that normalized. You know, and I might normalize them differently. I might normalize them to be the same absolute magnitude and see if they have uh, different differences that are in absolute fluxes as opposed to these normalized fluxes. So it really kind of depends on, on what you're doing for this kind of stuff. Great. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so we're getting to 10 2. So since I want to see if I've got more. Um, oh, I got one more thing in the math here, and then we'll take a little break. So um, all of those were uh, subtraction. What I'm going to do now is a case of division. And one example where we might want to do that is if we want to um, see if, uh, if there's a, you know, like a, a something that's multiplying the spectrum that might give rise to you know some kind of feature or we might want to normalize out the continuum shape of the spectrum to focus on the absorption features and so those cases you're really looking at a multiplicative process right if there's something that is scaling the spectrum that's a multipl multiplicative process if we want to get rid of the continuum we're dividing out the continuum so these are both multiplication division processes you wouldn't use addition or subtraction for these so this is what we're going to do. We're going to fit part of the spectrum and divide out that line and then see what the residuals are after I divide out the continuum. So I'm reading in an L4 spectrum with a good signal to noise. And then I'm going to trim the spectrum. This is another command or we saw before. Because I'm going to focus just on that narrow wavelength range. We get the rest of the spectrum, but we're going to cut it out and just focus on this one narrow, narrow range. This, is a, this corresponds to the J-band region, by the way. And then we're going to use a command in NumPy called polyfit. And this is a polynomial fit program. It's going to take the wave values, because the wave part of the spectrum is actually a quantity. And NumPy doesn't want to work with quantities. So we take the value part of that wave and the value part of the flux, and we're going to fit it to a single order polynomial. And just so we can see what that looks like, we'll print out what the fit parameters are. And then we're going to create a new template spectrum where we specifically specify the wavelength is the same as the wavelength from our original spectrum, but the flux is going to be the polynomial value. And I'm going to explicitly put back in the flux unit in here. So remember for working with quantity units, we have a number and then we multiply a unit. And what I'm doing is I'm taking the flux unit from my original spectrum, right? So I'm just borrowing it from there. 
So basically I'm making a new spectrum that consists of the wavelength of this range that we're fitting and a line that I fit to it. And then I'm gonna divide those two things out, right? So this I'm considering to be the continuum because I'm fitting a line to what I think the continuum is. And then I'm going to divide my original spectrum by the continuum. And then we're gonna see what the results look like. All right, so let's go ahead and run that and see what we do. So again, remember that we decided to narrow our wavelength range just to this range. You can see there is kind of a nice sort of general slope to this that's moving upward as we go to wavelength. And I fit this green line to it. And then after I've divided it out, you can see that the absorption features kind of stand out a little bit better, right? It's still pretty noisy spectrum in here, um, but I'm getting rid of sort of the overall slope of the spectrum so I can focus on the specific absorptions. And that's right here. In fact, these correspond to, I think this is probably, see, this is a L dwarf or no, it's an M7 dwarf. So this is probably titanium oxide. This is iron hydride here. All right, so if I had my labels, I could label them like that. But again, this is an example of an operation where I'd want to divide spectra by each other. Um, I'll just point out that Dino does this a lot because Dino usually takes spectra that still have the telluric absorption in it. And when he models those spectra, he has to multiply a spectrum by a telluric absorption model, basically. So that's, again, a multiplicative factor. All right, any questions about that? I know these are slightly more complicated examples, but I want to start getting into like, what are the kind of real things we do with the spectra? But again, they're all related to kind of the core pieces of, of what we do. And you know, the key piece here is that what I've done in this line is divide one spectrum by another spectrum. And the code manages to figure out, you know, how to do that uh, as a function of wavelength. Notice also that the, the, it doesn't actually say what the units are here, but the units for this are, uh, um, or there's no, there's actually no units for this because it's a, it's, we divide out a flux unit by a flux unit. So if I, for example, put in, um, let's see, my quantity was SP normalized. I typed SP normalized dot flux dot unit. I don't think that was, I think it was SP underscore normalized. Um, notice that it returns nothing because there is no unit because it's I've divided a flux by a flux. So it actually figures out how to do that as well. So again, all of the kind of key intricacies of doing this uh, division, addition, subtraction, multiplication are buried into how we define the symbols for those operations. And so all you have to do is just do a spectrum divided by another spectrum and takes care of all that. Okay. All right, one last thing is that's useful for uh, doing kind of a, a basic spectral math is what now that we can you know now we can subtract or add spectra from each other a natural thing to do is then compare two spectra from each other right because comparison really means line these things up and then subtract them and see what the difference looks like so that's a very common thing we do in spectra um like this is how we do classification by standards as we compare our spectrum to standards so the function that does that does this is called compare spectra so in this next cell here, I'm taking two L5s, but they're gonna be different L5s because I'm doing a random choice. And I'm going to run this command, splat compare spectra. And what that uh, routine returns is two variables. One is a uh, statistical comparison of the two spectra. In this case, it's a chi-square statistic. Um, and we'll get to a little bit about statistics, I think later in the, in the, the summer. But when we compare, say, two models or two spectra or model and data, um, there are various ways of sort of quantifying how good or bad those two spectra or whatever line up. So chi-squared is one of these statistics that we use frequently in science because it incorporates the uncertainties in the calculation as well. And then the other number it brings back is the scale factor. And it's the scale factor that I need to apply to the second spectrum to get it as close as possible to minimize the difference between the spectra. All right. So let me go ahead and run this. I also set plot equals true so that it will show the, the output of this. It's reading in the two spectra. And all right, scale's a little bit off. <laughs> so let's, let's try that again. Again, that's because of the noise over here. Let's try that again with maybe some less noisy spectra. There we go. All right, so it shows two L5s. You can see they are a little bit different. 
um, you can see the difference spectrum in blue here. And then it's also returned the chi-squared. Again, that's a measure of how different the spectra are relative to the noise. And then the scale factor. So we had to scale the second spectrum by a factor of a half in order to get it to align as good as possible. And um, we can change where we scale these spectra. So I'm going to, instead of just scaling across the entire thing, we're going to fit just in this 1 to 1.5 micron range. So let's make it 1, point, sorry, 1 to 1.25, so just in this region right here. So I specify that by this fit range parameter. So if I do that, notice that this now lines up better, but this side doesn't line up as well because I'm not actually trying to get it to agree over here. I'm just getting to agree here, which agrees actually pretty nicely, but it starts to diverge on this other side. And we get a smaller value for the chi-squared and a different scale factor because we're using a different region to do that calculation. And you know, once we know this, now I can actually use that scale factor to use my matplotlib tools because I can just scale up the second spectrum by what that scale factor we just computed is. And then I can just plot out the values like I did before above. By the way, this uh, I'll just point out this notation, this allows us to get rid of sort of the noisy areas on the side. So this should scale it up uh, much better. Um, and it actually didn't scale it quite, it actually underscaled it. So let's actually, uh, let's make this times 1.5, scale up. All right, so, oh, I shouldn't have scaled it twice. Let's go back here. Okay. All right, so the same plot, but now it's in, you know, a more general matplotlib environment, so I can add things here. And now you can see it lines up very nicely here, but it's very different on the other wavelengths. Okay, any questions on these kind of basic spectral manipulations? And there are some other, other manipulations you can do with the spectra that we haven't gone through just for lack of time, but I just want to point out the ones that we use the most often. Okay, why don't we take a, so it's five o'clock, why don't we take a five minute break here so we can uh, rest up. Uh, we'll be back at 5.05. And um, yeah, take a moment to kind of get a drink of water or take a bio break and we'll be back, we'll be back then. Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, we're going to finish up our uh, Splat tutorial uh, just now. I just wanna check in if uh, folks have had any questions before uh, while they're on break that came to mind. So the splat library just only works with existing spectra or can we just, uh, maybe I wasn't paying enough attention when, when the library was described, but can we construct any spectra that is, in, that is non-existent on, inside the library? Uh, the, so the answer is yes. And let me show you really quickly. We, we, we very briefly went through that. So don't worry if you missed it. Uh, let me bring up the uh, part of that. Let me share my screen here. So um, back up here, a little bit further back than I thought. Okay, so this line here. Um, so this is a file that exists. So, so to be frank, this is this is a similar to one of the the splat uh, files, but it's actually not in. The Splat library. It's just another file that we're we've kind of stored off uh, for future updates. So this source is not in the library. So this URL here points to the location of that file. And so what we're doing is we're uploading that spectrum file, which is not in the library, into a spectrum object. So all of the tools that I've been demonstrating are contained within the either the spectrum object or in the splat code that acts on spectrum objects. So the spectrum object is an important thing. You need to get the data in there to work with it. But this spectrum in particular is not part of the library. So some of these uh, codes where you like, talk about get spectrum or you search library, those are, those are in the library by definition. But you can read in a spectrum from outside the library by just explicitly downloading the file and then creating a new spectrum object 
with the file as one of the inputs. Does that help uh, explain it? Yes, a lot. Thanks. Yeah. Now, I will say this works for some spectra and not other spectra. It kind of depends how they're formatted. And this is actually one of the things that we've been working on is trying to figure out a way that it can do this more generally, um, you know, so that you can go and like download spectra from some other paper or from Sloan or other instruments. And we're still working on getting that to work. Um, but, you know, if there are ways that it doesn't work, there's actually kind of a few ways that you can kind of explicitly like just create a spectrum object by reading in a wavelength array, a flux array, and uncertain, uncertainty array. So there are hacks to doing this. Um, and if necessary, we can explore those hacks as part of our, our research. Um, the easiest way, of course, is read in something that's in the library, but there are lots of spectra that are not in there. And some of those we may actually be exploring in our, in our science research. So there's ways of getting them in. OK, uh, any other questions? All right, we're actually getting pretty close to the end here. Um, so the next part we're going to do is get into the, you know, I think more of the science stuff. At the last part was science. There's a lot of things that we do scientifically in terms of spectral manipulation. And here's our kind of the basic uh, measurements that we make very uh, often with our spectra. And one of those is, of course, classification, trying to figure out what kind of star we're looking at is part of that class spectral classification. So to demonstrate how this works, I'm going to uh, read in a, a random L5 dwarf here. We can plot that to make sure that that's the case. Yep. And um, the command that classifies using standards. So I should probably clarify a little bit that the sort of traditional way that we classify things, and this happens in astronomy, in biology, in other fields, is that you have a standard reference by which you compare other things to. So a good way to kind of think about this is when we talk about the meter, for hundreds of years, the meter was defined by a piece of metal that was one meter across. And that, would, that was the standard. And it you know, resides in France and they would make some copies and move them around the world. But basically, if you wanted to you know, make a new meter stick to make sure it's exactly a meter, you would compare it to this meter reference. Um, when we talk about the you know, species of animals, um, when we define, you know, when scientists define a new species, they collect an example of it and they put it in a museum and that becomes the reference for that species. Uh, so astronomers are kind of, you know, at least old school astronomers like myself are kind of the same way is when we define a new classification system for stars or galaxies or something like that, then we have very specific stars that define those spectral types. So when I say T5, there are a lot of things that are classified T5, but there's only one star that is the T5 standard. So when I say classified by standards, we're comparing against those individual sources that have been declared to be what a T5 is or T4 or whatever is supposed to be, right? And again, part of the reason for doing this is that it provides us with a purely empirical system that's robust to say changes in um, our understanding of stars. Um, you know, you could, you, one thing you could do is you can maybe classify stars based on their temperature, but we don't necessarily know what the temperatures are. Um, and sometimes our knowledge about those is changing over time. But if we say that this star is the T5 standard, as long as the star doesn't change very much, then, you know, that's going to be true for, for all time. So that's just kind of a little bit background about what I mean by classified by standard. We're using actual known standard stars and comparing their spectra to our source. So <laughs> that L precursor was for starting this line, which is going to read in the standards that we have defined here and then compare to our spectrum and pick the best one. Uh, and this is gonna take a, a few seconds here because it actually has to go through and read in all of the standards and then compare those standards directly to our source. So that's why on the first call, this is, takes a little bit of time and there we go. So. Here's our output, and I got a plot output because it put plot equals true. So the black line here is the source I've read in. The red line is our standard, and you can see it's a really good match, actually. Um, you know, this is undoubtedly uh, an L6, even though I actually searched for L5s, which is kind of interesting. Um, right, so, but that's a really good match to the standard. Um, I can do this again for another L dwarf um, and run the classification, which will take much more quickly because it's already read in the standards. And you can see now that's a really good match to the L5 standard. 
So it's gone through and done all these comparisons in the background. But in the end, what you get out is what is the best fit? And then also the output is two numbers. One is your spectral type and one is the uncertainty in the spectral type. So I'm gonna do this one more time because I wanna get a unusual source, see if I can get, yeah, that's a good one. All right, so this one fits to an L3 standard, but notice it's not a really good fit. So there's different ways that we can compare these standards. And I should, I'll take a moment here that these standards all live as a list of spectrum objects in this uh, code variable called standards dwarf specs. If I just print that out, you can see it's actually not, it's a list, it's a dictionary where it's a spectral type that points to a specific spectrum. And there's a list of these going from M through T's all the way through T9. Now, like I said, this did not fit perfectly. So maybe it's a little bit of a weird object. And um, I can change how I do the classification. There's different sort of uh, details about this, but there's uh, one of the researchers in this field, David Kirkpatrick, has sort of defined a way for doing this in the near infrared that's different from the optical. And that's just comparing to a particular wavelength range. And instead of having trying to remember what that wavelength range ranges every time, you can just set the method to classify to be the Kirkpatrick method just by the string there. And if I plot that one, what you'll notice is it will fit this part of the spectrum very well. And in fact, it lines up pretty nicely and it classifies in L5, but the two spectra start to diverge at longer wavelengths. And in fact, this black line is an example of an object that we call a blue L dwarf because its spectrum is bluer. So there's less red light. Red light is of course on the right side here than the standard. So by focusing our classification in this range, then we can see a difference between uh, the other parts, which allows us to give kind of a subclassification that this is a blue L5 dwarf. Um, so that's something we have to do visually, but this is why plotting the, the plots can be a good way to do this. All right. um, there are other standards we can use. So these are the dwarf standards. We can also read in, uh, there are other classes of stars that depend on their metallicity or whether they're a giant star, those will have different spectra. Uh, so for example, if I want to look at the subdwarf standards, I can initialize standards that we've specified as SD, that's the shorthand for subdwarf. If I run that command and look at this other variable, standards underscore sd.specs, you see that we've read in now a whole list of other spectra that have this slightly different notation. And again, that notation specifies a metal pore of a star or brown dwarf. And we can see how that matches. Let's look at uh, getting a spectrum of spectral type M7, which is known to be a subdwarf. And again, we'll just pick one there. And then we'll run this classified by standard, but set SD equals true. Again, that SD stands for subdwarf. And hopefully what comes back looks right. Um, and again, this is a pretty good match, but it's a good match to a very different kind of standard. If I ran this same, classification, let me just mask it out so I have the same spectrum. If I got rid of this SD equals true, notice that I would get something that doesn't match very well, but it matches much better when I run the command that says SD equals true. So this is where we start to see more subtle variations in the spectra. And by having a sort of parallel set of standards, we can actually say, ah, it fits a subdwarf standard better than a dwarf standard. So it must be a subdwarf star as opposed to a dwarf star. So there, there was a lot of astronomical detail in there. So I wanna take a pause and see if there's any questions about that. Okay, not seeing any right off the top. Um, there are other subclasses. There are extreme subdwarfs, ultra subdwarfs. There are dwarf subdwarf mixtures. There are young uh, templates as well. So there's a whole set of these templates that are, are defined. And there are corresponding sort of uh, template sets that are also can be defined in here. And again, that's, that's kind of buried in the code. Um, okay, so another way that we classify spectra, instead of just comparing it directly to a standard star, is to use spectral indices. And these are essentially measurements of colors on the spectrum, but they focus on very narrow regions. Um, 
to just check one thing here because there was a way that I was going to show I can plot these uh, indices. Um, yeah, so I think. Okay, sorry. I thought I had this plot very up easily, but I don't have it right now. But um, in any case, um, uh, let's bring in a spectrum here. And what we're going to do is we're going to measure an index set. And these indices are defined as basically we're taking narrow ranges of wavelengths in the spectrum and just taking the ratio of the fluxes in there. And so that value can be used to measure, say, the strength of a water feature, where right? we saw these features labeled in some of the spectra. Um, so let's read in one of the spectra. And I'm going to um, explicitly label out the uh, the L dwarf features in that spectrum. And then we're going to measure this index set uh, that's uh, from this particular paper that I wrote some time ago. So here's the plot. And again, I've measured, I've specifically labeled some of the features here. And then this code returns back this list or this dictionary, excuse me. And each of these different strings here is an index that's defined in this particular publication. And following that is the measurement and the uncertainty. Now, these different uh, like strings here are corresponding to specific parts of the spectrum that we're measuring. And just to visualize it, the, for example, the, um, this water J, H2OJ feature, is measuring the strength of this feature here, here compared to this part. So for example, you can see that that value is about 0.6. It's because about 60% of the light is decreased from this continuum point to the bottom of this band. Um, now, it's a little hard to visualize it, and I apologize, I don't have uh, the visualization up quite yet. Um, but these indices give you sort of a way of quantifying the key features of the spectrum. Instead of looking at the entire spectrum, we now have a set of eight numbers that tell us about sort of all the patterns that are present in the spectrum. It's a nice way of kind of condensing the information down. Now, you can get information about these indices. There's in the spectral splat.empirical package, which I've shortened to SPEM. There's a code called info underscore indices. And I say there's a bunch of these info underscore something in there um, that tell you a little bit more about what, uh, what variables are available. And um, what this reports then is that there are several of these index sets. So Burgasser is the one we've used here, Burgasser 2006. Um, I've written the code in such a way that you can often use kind of shorthand for some of these things. So um, if you don't get exactly the full name right, it'll, it'll check to see if you've got something close. And um, it provides the bib code, the reference for this, this citation. And then it tells you how these indices are measured. So for this particular set, H2OJ, for example, is taking the ratio between 1.14, 1 1.165, and divided by 1.26 to 1.285. So we go back to our spectrum here. That's again taking, um, let me go back and look at that again, uh, 1.14. So actually, I'm sorry, that's this region right here. It's taking this region here and dividing by this region here, right? And that's how it's calculating that index. So you can get some information about what kind of indices are up there. Um, I don't expect at this point you know which index set to use, but these are the index sets that are available. Um, and there's just a huge variety of them based on different publications. And some of them are applicable to shorter wavelength data, some are applicable to longer wavelength data. It just depends on what the papers were. All right. So this kind of gives you a little taste of how much information is provided in the empirical part of the SPLAT code. And again, we've just gone through and we've gone through papers and pulled out the ways they define these various indices so we can make these measurements. All right. So for example, we can use then these index sets. There's another code called classify by index. And what it does is it will take as a reference one of these index sets. And if it has a way of mapping index values to spectral type, it will then analyze the, the spectrum to get this classification and return the result. And I'm setting this other flag verbose equals true. Many of the codes have this extra parameter verbose equals true to kind of give a little bit more feedback about what the code is doing. Normally this would just return a spectral type and uncertainty, but here I can actually get some uh, reporting on the values that it's measured. So here are the four indices that are present in this paper, here are their values. And then here are the spectral types that correspond 
to those indices. And then these stars basically tell you which one of these indices was used to determine a classification. Because it turns out that there are some spectral indices that are applicable to some spectral type ranges and not others. So the code kind of takes that into account. And so what you get in the end is a overall, uh, again, average spectral type from these two uh, uh, indices and the uncertainty, which takes into account the uncertainty weighting on this. All right. So Again, the details are not as important to understand necessarily how this index come into existence, but that there are multiple ways of making these measurements. And, you know, for example, you could scroll through all of these different index sets with a nice for loop and get all of the classifications from these different various uh, ways of doing it. Um, and that might be like a, you know, a way of sort of summarizing the system at uncertainty in these uh, index uh, classifications. Okay, any questions on that? Carlos is pretty clear. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Um, okay. One last classification uh, method is classified by gravity. So all of these uh, classifications we've done are really fundamentally tied to the temperature of the source, because temperature is the thing that controls whether you have water in the atmosphere or iron hydride or methane or carbon monoxide, whatever. Um, but uh, if you think back to your chemistry days, temperature and pressure are important for making molecules or allowing different species to exist. And pressure is directly related in the atmosphere. Pressure is related to the surface gravity of the source. So uh, other researchers have gone through and looked and see if they can quantify pressure sensitive, which are actually surface gravity sensitive features. And this gives us a second handle on the physical properties of these objects. So much of the classifications we've talked about so far are usually mapped directly to temperature. But we can also see if we can measure gravity separately through these particular gravity indices. And they're all actually based on this one paper by Allers and Lou 2013. So um, let me bring up a young spectrum here. Actually, just to emphasize its weirdness. So there is the spectrum. Um, I don't know if it doesn't look very young, but we'll go with it. Um, let me do a quick uh, classify by standard on this using Kirkpatrick, uh, method equals Kirkpatrick. Um, that does actually look pretty young. So let me try another one here. That looks like the same exact source. Okay, let's go with that one. Um, all right, so if I do a classify by standard on that one, so you'll notice that in this case, the black line actually kind of is above the spectral standard. Previously, we saw a standard where this black line was below it. Now we see that it's above it. And this is typical for low gravity sources. Um, there's other subtle differences here, and they're so subtle, maybe I'll try one more spectrum to see if I get something that's a little bit higher than the noise. In fact, we'll set the signal to noise ratio a little bit higher. Oh, that looks like a beautiful one. Okay, so if I uh, click on the classify by standard for this one, um, you'll notice that the best fitting standard really isn't a very good fit. Um, it actually misses a lot there. And so um, that's likely because this thing is quite young. So if I do spot, I classify gravity, and with this verbose equals true, it's gonna measure several of the indices and it's gonna figure out, is any of these indicative of low surface gravity features? And indeed, what it comes back with is the classification VLG, that means very low gravity. If I do this with other sources, this would come back as uh, normal gravity. So for example, if I put in the, uh, the M8 standard, which we can access by putting in standard dwarf specs M8.0, I put in that source, it'll come back and say it's a field G, which is what you get from most of these sources. But this spectrum is very weird, and it's weird in a way that's consistent with a very low gravity object. So one thing we can do then is we can actually then, knowing that this is the case, we could go back and run uh, classified by standard. 
but in this case, use the VLG template. So I'm going to do VLG equals true, and that should should load up the very low gravity templates. I'm just going to take a little bit here because I've got to load them up. And I forgot to put plot equals true. Okay. Now, honestly, that doesn't actually look much better. Um, so maybe there's a different uh, source that this corresponds to. Um, I think this is actually probably an even, even lower gravity thing, and it's just not setting the right standards. Let's try beta equals true. That's the one I want. Nope, that's not it. Nope, that's not it. Okay, so I don't quite have the right syntax here. Um, but in any case, this is, you know, we're starting to, we're trying to figure out why this thing is unusual. We can compare it to the low gravity standards. It may not be that this is low gravity, maybe this is something else that's going on. Um, but this is kind of the process we, fo we follow by sort of exploring this. We see that it's unusual compared to the dwarf standards. We make a guess that maybe it's a low gravity thing. We make a measurement of the indices. And if that pans out, then we'll try uh, looking at the standards. Um, and I do think I just have the wrong syntax for this last statement. But in any case, this is kind of the process we do for classifying and getting down to the point where do we know what kind of source this is. And, you know, for example, knowing that's low gravity, that's actually corresponds to a young brown dwarf. So this immediately tells us that perhaps this is a member of a young cluster that's nearby. And it's going to be a lower mass object because, you know, young M dwarfs are brown dwarfs. And so this is telling us that we've actually found a brown dwarf potentially in a young cluster. So these are why we want to make these kind of measurements. Okay, any questions at this point? Because I'm going to turn you loose on an exercise to see how that, how that all stuff. An exercise, of course, that has a solution at the end of it. Okay, either everything is absolutely clear or I've lost everyone. That's how it goes. Um, all right, well, let's go ahead and jump into the exercise then. So here's your task. Um, and again, if you get stuck, there's, a, there's some hints down at the bottom. So one of the real science cases that we explore uh, is in studying the spectra is to find binary systems where it's a binary composed of two different brown dwarfs that we don't resolve, but we can see the two spectra overlap in such a way to make a kind of a weird spectrum. And so the, that's what you're gonna do. You're gonna bring in the spectrum of this one particular source, which you're gonna reference by the short name. You're gonna measure the indices and compare to spectral standards. And then you're gonna generate a binary template. You're gonna take a L5 and a T5 in the library, scale them to their absolute magnitudes, add them together, and then compare them to our the system, which we know is a binary, and see if you can get a better match that way. So uh, what I'm going to do is going to let you work on that for the next, uh, I'd say, 10, 15 minutes. And then we'll come back and um, I'll go through the solution so you get an idea of how to work that together. So you're on your own. If you have any questions, uh, we'll be here to answer them, either through the chat window or you can voice up. Have you shown how to like download the Jupyter notebook from GitHub? Uh, at the very beginning, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone was yeah, supposed I, to be I, on. I, I everyone was that. supposed to be on the notebook at the beginning. Yeah. So who is on the notebook right now? If you raise your thumbs up or raise your hand. Okay. All right, so about half of you. So if you're not, okay, thank you, Danielle. Uh, so if you're not on the notebook now, Roma's not on the notebook, I don't know why. <laughs> um, uh, I'm happy, so what I'll do is I'm gonna set up a separate um, breakout room. If you're having trouble with that, I'm gonna go in there and you can, uh, I'll invite you and you can ask a question there so we, we don't interrupt folks as they're, they're working. So I will just make one. And you should see um, a, in your lower window a breakout room that you can join if you want to. So I'm going to go in there. And then uh, if you want to uh, get help from there, I'm there to help you with the setup. And then um, if you have other questions, uh, Dino and Roman will stay out here in the main room. OK, so I figure I have to go in that room. OK, be right back.
Okay, how's everyone doing? I'm doing kind of good. Okay, okay, good. All right, well, we're at uh, 10, almost 10 minutes too. So um, I know I'm giving away the solution a little bit. However, of course, the solution is there, so it's pretty easy to give it away. Um, I do want to go through a little bit how we uh, solve this exercise and mostly just kind of the talk through the different pieces of it. Um, and again, I'll invite you to kind of explore this on your own. Um, uh, but, you know, we're going to have similar kinds of research based examples as we go through forward uh, to other other parts. Um, let me make sure up here. OK, so. Um, so there's the exercise. So here's what the solution looks like. And it's all in one block. And I, probably not the best way to do it, but I'll just kind of walk through what each of these pieces means. Um, so, and all of these are using pieces of the code that we talked about in the previous part of the, this, uh, the, the uh, uh, tutorial here. So, um, so again, our, our goal is to read in this particular spectrum, measure its indices, compare it to spectral standards, and then compare it to a binary template. So this is, of course, the code to read in the source, right? And we're using this short name key uh, to do that. So I think maybe actually what I'll do is I will break this up into little pieces so you can see how it goes. And then I'm also, just for convenience, normalizing it so that I have something that's easy to work with. All right, so there's our code. It's normalized. And you can see, you know, it looks kind of like a T-dwarf, but it's a, if you stare at these long enough, it looks a little weird. I always have to take my word for that. Um, the indices is very easy. We're just going to use the splat measure index set using the Burgasser set. And if I set verbose equals true, it will give me a little report of those individual indices there. Right? Uh, so those are, again, quantitative measurements that we can use to characterize the source. Um, the next step is the classify. And that, again, uses just the uh, splat.classify by standard code. And I'm just leaving it blank on the end, but in this case, I'll put a plot equals true here so we can see what that looks like. And I have a little print statement afterwards to, to actually print out what the spectral type and its uncertainty is. And by the way, I don't think we talked about this in the Python code, but there's different ways of formatting strings so you can kind of insert variables into those strings. And this is an example of that. This is a string that starts with a, with a return character, so it starts a new line. And then there's these curly braces that then match to individual parameters that I put here in the format statement. So, you know, if you're looking for ways to kind of automatically report things that have variables in them, this is a good way to do it. But let's take a look at this classification. You can see that it's not really very good. Um, you know, it matches to an L8 standard, but it's totally wrong. And actually, interestingly, if you look at the difference between those, again, if you're familiar with these spectra, this looks itself like a T-dwarf spectrum. So this is already a clue that perhaps this source is the sum of two spectra, right? Two stars that are next to each other that are both contributing light. And therefore we're getting the sum of those two spectra. All right. So, and that, you know, that really comes from just visualizing the classification. So now it's a matter of putting together the binary. And I'm going to combine these two steps here. So we're first going to read in just a random L5, a random T5 with a good signal to noise. We're going to make sure it's not already known to be a binary, because there are other binary uh, blended light stars in this, in this uh, catalog. And we'll just take the uh, first ones that come out. This next line is using a command that we didn't really talk about in the uh, above, but it's giving you as a hint. This is using the empirical function type to mag. And basically, what we're doing is we're taking uh, this particular reference that provides a polynomial fit between the spectral type of a source and what its absolute magnitude is in this particular filter, T mass J. So the parameters are the spectral type, the filter, the uh, set or the reference that we're using for this. And normally, this brings back two numbers, the magnitude, absolute magnitude, and its uncertainty. And all I want at this point is the absolute magnitude. So I'm using the zeroth order here. So if I run that piece of the code, it's reading in those two files, not doing anything with them, but then it's reporting out what those absolute J magnitudes are. Now remember that larger numbers means fainter source, right? So this is 
the T5, it's saying that's about a magnitude fainter or roughly a factor of uh, 3.3 or a factor of two or three fainter than uh, this other source. All right, so next step is to scale the spectra with those magnitudes and add them together. So I'm going to paste that in here, and then I'm actually going to plot what that spectrum looks like. All right, so this is using this flux calibrate, and we saw this earlier, taking the filter, the magnitude, which we figured out here, and again, setting it to F equals true. We flux calibrate the two individual spectra separately, and then we just use that plus addition to add them together, and then we've got a combined spectrum. And that's starting to look a little bit like the source that we're studying here. All right, it's got kind of a weird set of, of features here. All right, so now what's really left to do is just compare the spectra. So I'm going to insert that as a separate box here and I'm gonna plot that difference, All right? So I'm using my splat compare and I'm actually doing it to two different ones. I'm comparing to the dwarf standard that we figured out before, and that's indexed by the spectral type that we uh, were able to infer from that classification. And I'm also comparing it to this binary template that I've created. And then I'm going to look at the difference between the original star and this binary template. And I think I have to first, uh, sorry about that. Let me do one quick thing here. It's a little bit out of order. I think I first have to scale the binary template by the factor that's going to bring it to the best scale, right? So remember that scale factor is the second output from this compare spectra. So I'm gonna compare that spectrum and then plot the difference. And you can see this is just the difference. It's a long, uh, long legend here because you're doing a lot of math. But you can see it's a little bit different, but it's actually not too bad, as we'll see when we compare everything together. Um, it may not be exactly the right fit because it's not just a flat line at zero, but it's 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 not too bad, not too bad. Um, okay, so then uh, the last thing we're going to do is actually going to plot all that together, and that's all of this code here. And you know, this comes partly from uh, Christian's presentation on Matt Pot Live. There's probably a few new things in here that you're not seeing, you haven't seen before. Um, again, you want to use this as sort of like a, a basis for exploring other options. We provide you sort of different formats for doing this, partly because we do this in different ways, uh, but also because it allows you to see some of the different parameters. Um, but again, we're just we're making a figure, we're making a subplot, so we're going to have two plots on top of each other. On the first plot, we're going to plot our spectrum of our binary, and then the spectrum of the standard, with it scaled according to the best uh, scaling uh, relation. And then we're going to plot our spectrum compared to the primary, secondary, and binary. So the L5, T5, and the sum, all scaled so that they scale appropriately. So let's run this whole unit here. And so it goes through and does all those different measurements. And at the very end, this is our result. So here is our comparison with the standard. Again, we see that it's not a very good fit. And then here's a comparison showing the original source in black, the primary in, sorry, the primary in magenta, the T dwarf secondary in blue, and then the sum is in green. And it's a better fit. It's not a perfect fit, but it's certainly a better fit than that standard. So at least starts to point that perhaps this is one of the reasons it's so unusual. And of course, what we can do now is maybe build up a code that's going to search through many different combinations of L dwarfs and T dwarfs to find the one that makes the most match. We've just made a guess of just two random templates, but we could do this a little bit smarter and try to find the two templates that really uh, fit the source best. All right, so, and, and I should say, I have a whole paper <laughs> that's basically devoted to doing this process. We have a whole area of research uh, of studying things called spectral binaries that are these blends of uh, say L and T dwarfs. Um, and you can see that, you know, you can get at least a, a very rough idea of the science down in just one of these little uh, Python cells. Um, so again, if you didn't follow all of that along completely, don't worry about it um, because this is all very new to everyone. 
But the goal is to kind of show like how you can use some of these tools together to actually answer a, a more complex science question. How do we tell if something is a binary or not? And that can happen either through the indices or it can happen through doing these uh, template comparisons. All right, so I encourage you to go back and play with this a little bit on your own um, and to explore some of the other features. And again, we didn't go through everything. And if you wanna know what other sort of options there are for some of these codes, again, you can always put the name of the function with a question mark after that, and it will give you the doc string that says what some of the options are. And again, the main thing you should be doing is kind of playing with these and sort of seeing what happens if I turn this on or turn this off, what does that do to the, the plot? How does it change? What's measured? Uh, this is all part of the sort of exploration you should be doing uh, as we start to build up to the science projects. So any questions uh, as, we, as we wrap up today? A bunch of, but let's practice. <laughs> Fair enough. And if you do have questions now or as you practice mm -hmm. in you know, the next little while, uh, Dina will have office hours uh, in, imminently, um, which will be at a, a different Zoom link. I don't know if Dina, you want to share that Zoom link into the uh, chat window so folks have it. Um, but that's also listed on the, the calendar. And again, as you play, um, you know, please do uh, come to office hours. Now, we're going to wrap up office hours for this week. Dina's the last one. We're going to start up again next week. But I will have office hours on Monday. So again, practice these things out. See if something doesn't work or it does work, um, when you have questions of why it's not working, we're, we're absolutely available to help uh, with any of these technical questions. And of course, with the scientific questions if they start to emerge. Okay. All right, so tomorrow at uh, uh, 10 o'clock, I think, is our next uh, meeting up time. Uh, that's meant to be just kind of an end of the week um, uh, sort of get together. I don't have anything planned. There's no workshop for that part. Um, it's just meant to kind of get together. And at this point, there's obviously not much to show for this week because you've mostly been doing workshops. Um, so we're going to kind of keep it light and just kind of talk about like, you know, some of the ideas. But please come to Friday morning with any questions you have. Uh, Juan had a, a few great questions during our little mini breakout session. Um, if there are words you don't know, um, if there's something in the readings or the videos that were confusing, um, the goal of Friday is to kind of have an opportunity to kind of hash all that stuff out. So, um, you know, let's, I'll see you then tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Uh, Dino's got uh, office hours right now um, and we're here to help your questions. So uh, great job uh, following uh, all of the <laughs> workshops this week. Six workshops in one week is amazing. You've done 12 hours of workshops already. That's amazing. Um, but uh, we'll have a little bit more uh, uh, slower pace of workshops after this. Um, we'll be starting to get into the actual research starting uh, next week. Okay. Uh, I, one, one more question about, yes, the, Saturday, about, about the Saturday. Uh, even we are uh, no, um, we are beginners on this. I am beginner on this yeah. observation area. But how how will be? I mean, there is it, um, you you told us about the event of the Saturday night. Yes. Yeah. Um, Thank you for reminding me. Yes. How, how is this? Um, I mean, <laughs> what's it, what is this? So, um, so Saturday night we'll be using the IRTF specs instrument, which is the instrument that all these data come from. Um, it's for a project that we're doing with a group actually uh, centered in Tenerife and Madrid. So you'll have Spanish colleagues there. Um, and like everything we're doing right now, everything's remote. So what, we'll, what I'll be doing is sending around the remote connection uh, to uh, view uh, what we're doing as part of the observations. Um, and uh, you know, basically you know, sometime after, I would say sometime after 10 o'clock, because we take a little while to kind of get things up and running, um, you can log into that, uh, that Zoom chat and we will um, we'll be observing. And I will be talking through how we're taking the observations um, and kind of sharing sort of the process that we actually collect the data. So you're not required to do the observing. Um, if that's not the, that's not the goal. It's so you can see what it's like to actually collect the data. Um, and you're going to, you're going to hear us throw around some of the words we've been using, like right ascension and declination. What's the sidereal time? What's the air mass? So you'll get to see how that's actually used 
uh, in terms of planning the observations. And then, you know, next week you're going to be starting to reduce raw specs data to final, like all the data you've seen today are all fully processed and, and have been reduced. But we're going to be going through the process of reducing over the course of the next uh, couple of weeks. So you'll see how the raw data is collected and kind of see what that looks like. And then the goal is for the next couple of weeks to see how we transform those raw data to the kind of data that we saw today that we can actually do analysis and measurements for. Does that help explain, Adriana, for, for Saturday? Yeah. Yes, yes, sounds pretty clear, um, okay. as Carlos said. <laughs> but how how can we participate if we want to um, just be around, or sneak around, or just? Well, like I said, I will send out the so it'll be through Zoom. So I'll send around the Zoom link. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course. Okay. All right. Thanks everyone. Uh, see you. Uh, see you tomorrow morning. Uh, otherwise, uh, Dino also has office hours if you want to ask a few more questions. And have a great rest of your day.